Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Preston Staley, and uh, we're excited to have you all here. I'm with my esteemed colleagues, the president of the AAA, Alfredo Viegas, and the chairman of the GRT, the Gateway Remote Telescope Committee, the Honorable Stan Hansa. And uh, there he is. And uh, so this is our lecture number two. Our first lecture was in January, late Jan. No, I'm sorry, uh, late November. And uh, we were very excited about that. A great crowd. And uh, this is a, a new for those of you who don't know what's going on here. And why would everybody know? Because it's so new. But this is a new project for the AAA. Uh, we have a remote telescope located in the dark skies of far west Texas over by the McDonald Observatory on a mountain 6,000 feet high, uh, with very dark skies and an extraordinary instrument, actually two, uh, which we'll get into a little later. And um, so uh, we're excited and people have been joining. Uh, we have various different tiers of participation. You can pay to be a, a scope operator and you can also pay a certain amount of money to get first dibs on the hot data coming off the scope and be a target selector. And these these um, options are on our website at AAA.org. That's AAA.org. And just click on the gateway tab. Um, and one of our long-term goals uh, as we work out the bugs, because this, again, is all new to us. So we're learning how, how to put the data together, how to get everybody, uh, how to share uh, the uh, time on the scope, how to share the files and so forth. Uh, but one of our goals down the road is also a community outreach. So uh, we'd like to see this thing uh, work with the community more, uh, school kids and stuff like that. Uh, give kids the ability to be able to actually have a relationship, a profound relationship to the cosmos in terms of, of you know, uh, actually seeing something that they're controlling and that they're accessing, you know, millions of light years away. It's just, it's really cool. And I also will say that one of the uh, surprising things that that cropped up after our first lecture was um, people who um, are physically challenged uh, really are excited about this as well. Uh, people that are not able to get out into the field like so many of us can, and and uh, and that's that's an important aspect uh, uh, that I, I don't think we had really. Uh, uh, had seen coming, and it's it's been uh, significant as well. So uh, we welcome your feedback. Uh, we have a chat box tonight as we go, and I'll, we'll try to um, uh, get your questions as we go. And um, and tonight also, um, assuming it gets dark enough and pretty soon, um, we have an open roof on the observatory. So that means for the first time, we'll be doing a live sky presentation, at least for part of this uh, lecture tonight. And so without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Stan Honda, and he and Alfredo are going to uh, show you the ropes. So take it away, Stan. All right. Thanks a lot, Preston. I thought I'd show you a Stellarium view of the sky from far west Texas. And uh, yeah, this is what it looks like in uh, Right about now, the, the sun is set, it's starting to get dark, still a little bit of twilight, but uh, I'll show you the locations of some of the objects that will uh, that Alfredo will give, give us a tour of tonight from the Gateway uh, Telescope rig. So one of them is gonna be the Triangulum Galaxy, which is uh, M33, and that's sort of located in high in the, high in the south. I'll add a couple, I'll add some of the, uh, the constellation lines you might might be familiar with the constellation lines from various maps and all that. So we're looking generally in the south direction, uh, more toward the southeast is uh, Orion, Sirius, Aldebaran, and the Pleiades, which you might recognize uh, from the sky, which we, we can we can actually see a lot of that from in New York City. But we'll uh, we'll show you the Triangulum Galaxy, which is a pretty pretty amazing galaxy, just a very dense dense shape and a, a, a spiral galaxy. Uh, another object that we'll be showing you will be um, M31, which everybody I think knows as the Andromeda galaxy, which is more in the uh, sort of the west to the northwest. Uh, here's Cassiopeia, which is uh, the familiar constellation there. And the, uh, 
Polaris and North Star is here. The Big Dipper is just coming up above the horizon uh, uh, over on here. Those are the familiar constellations. And uh, as, we, as, as we zoom in, uh, we'll see uh, the Andromeda galaxy in its, in its familiar shape. And that's something that it's, it's fairly large. I think it's five or six, the diameter of about five or six blue moons across. And so are the uh, AT60 telescope that we have, which is a much wider field with the one-shot color camera is something that can easily image, image that object. Another, uh, another nebula that we'll be looking at is uh, the California Nebula, which is a fairly popular nebula to shoot. It's pretty high in the sky tonight, uh, more toward the northeast to east. And, uh, we got a big moon up. In fact, uh, I think it's the day before uh, full moon, so kind of a bright moon, but uh, I think being in a fairly dark location uh, that the Gateway Telescope is, uh, we could still do uh, a fair amount of, of imaging. So as we zoom in, you see that familiar shape of looking like the state of state of California, uh, if you look at it from the, uh, from the east northeast. And if we've got time, uh, we'll go to M42, which everybody knows is the Orion Nebula, a very popular, very large object uh, in, in the constellation uh, of Orion as uh, we're looking, looking southeast. That'll start rising to the sky during the night. So be a little bit higher if we can get to it toward the end of the program. Very spectacular object, very large, something you can actually see with your naked eye. Might not be able to see it from uh, New York unless it's a pretty clear clear night, uh, but definitely from darker, uh, even, even darker suburban areas, and uh, especially from a place like North South Lake where the, the AAA does the uh, offsite dark, dark sky observing. So we'll take a look at those objects tonight, and uh, and then Alfredo will give us a little tour of the of a live view of our uh, gateway telescope. Go ahead, Alfredo. Let me uh, stop sharing here. Okay. Um, so so I guess Stan, do you want me to? Um, I'll just do the. I'll just show the scope quickly, and then um, we'll, we'll do that little presentation that I had as well. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. So let me just go ahead and All right. So, okay, so um, this is the observatory um, and I'll just show you a couple cameras. So um, the, this is the um, roll off roof. There's, there's actually two um, roll off roofs at this observatory location. Um, you can actually see there's a little scope right here that's moving. I don't know if you see my cursor. Uh, our scope is this one right here on the, on the left side. Uh, you can see there's a bunch of scopes here um, that are currently uh, operating. Uh, it looks like it's not dark, but it is actually kind of dark there. It's just that the gain in the camera from the observatory makes it look a little brighter than it is. And I'll show you kind of another view here. Uh, here's another view. Um, you can actually see this other scope here. Someone's moving it around. Uh, and here's another view. Um, and again, our scope is this one back here. Um, I was just getting it up and running. So I just actually focused it on, on Andromeda on M31. So you can actually see, um, here's the actual live view. This is a, a 30 second exposure from our camera. Um, and this is M31. Uh, we'll, we'll make it look a little better after we've, um, after we've sort of um, worked it out a little bit. But we actually have um, two telescopes. Um, so this is, if you look again um, at the scope here, um, the very large scope is an Astrophysics 175. And then there's two other scopes on this. There's a guide scope that's actually a Takahashi um, a guide scope. And then there's uh, the other scope, which is uh, an AT60 uh, wide field uh, telescope. Uh, and that's the one that I was just showing you here that had the, um, uh, the image of Andromeda. Um, and we basically have both of these um, scopes connected. So this is the actual live view to right now from that scope. And I can actually pull up uh, the other scope. Here's the other scope. And I can control it similarly with a similar kind of interface. Um, this program is called NINA, uh, which we use to effectively uh, image with the scope. And um, this, this scope is going to have a much, a much smaller field of view. And let's say I, I, I wanted to take a, say, a 10-second exposure. Uh, 
and we'll just I'm just I'm just actually kind of curious to see what we're pointing on this one. It, it's a little bit off center from the other scopes. So we're not going to actually see um, M31. We'll probably see a piece of it, but not the whole thing. You can hey, actually Alfredo. see. Alfredo. Yeah. Uh, someone's at, David is asking if we can enlarge the screen, and then he may have to do that on his end. I'm not sure. Okay, how about this? Is it better if I do that? Good question. It's smaller. You can actually see Andromeda is over here on the side. It's actually, and this is actually M110, which is a satellite galaxy for Andromeda. So it doesn't quite, uh, it's not in the same frame because the two scopes are not perfectly aligned. It's one of the things we have to do when we go back out there is actually line up the two scopes. Um, but anyways, um, we'll go into more a little bit more on this um, after when we actually start imaging. We haven't we haven't started imaging yet. We just were we were just getting things lined up. Um, let me. Also, what there. camera? What camera are you using on the AT60? That's the uh, ZWO twenty six hundred camera that we're using on that. Got it. All right, so let me go ahead and go into the other one there. Okay, so let me, let me go into this for a bit. Now, can every, can everybody see that? Yep. All right, cool. So, so here's another image uh, of the telescope over here, um, uh, and a close up of the of both telescopes. So you can actually see the big telescope with the camera on the end here. That's the that's the Astrophysics 175. And in this picture over here, you can actually see the little telescope, which is little, this little telescope here, um, with an autofocuser and with the um, the uh, um, uh, 2600 camera on on it over here. Um, so that that's the actual setup we have. There's both these telescopes. They're um, they're control they're they're uh, um, on a uh, 10 micron um, uh, th uh, HP 3000 mount, which is super accurate, um, and it basically holds this uh, combination pretty well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we do in terms of um, uh, just uh, uh, grabbing images. So. The, the most astrophotography telescopes um, like this setup, um, they're not really they're not really uh, uh, geared toward live viewing. Kind of what we're going to try to do today. <laughs> they're not really geared toward that. They're really geared more toward um, uh, down, uh, taking images, downloading those images, and then uh, processing them. Usually, you know, on, on your home computer. And um, you know, the process of doing that is in this little graphic I have here. Basically, you, you, you aim your telescope at an object, you take a series of, of pictures. Um, unlike uh, terrestrial photography, um, you have to take what we call calibration images as well. Um, we basically take images um, that are, um, that are uh, uh, light frames, and then we take images that we call dark frames and, uh, and then flat frames. And those two latter um, uh, types of images, we subtract from um, uh, the main image in order to basically have a clean a clean final image that we then that we then basically stack. Um, see if I can pull up something here for a second. Um, so um, so anyways, the bottom line is when you what I was going to show you was this little image here, which is basically that um, when you when you take an image of the night sky uh, through a telescope, the the vast majority of the data is actually just black. And that's kind of what we call the histogram. If you look at this little graph down here, and we, we in the AAA we offer a, a number of, of courses uh, on image processing. We can go into a lot more detail here. But the bottom line is, what we're basically trying to do usually is just isolate the very small amount of data that's usually at the very left hand of, of the of the histogram or at the very darkest part of the of the histogram, and um, and then basically tease it out uh, and process it to go from kind of something like this to something like this after it's been calibrated and then finally to something like that that actually is the image that we're trying that we're trying to achieve um, and in the process of doing that with the uh, AAA's um, uh, uh, gateway remote telescope we basically use uh, any desk program to control um, the telescope so um, actually we had one of our one of our members kind of joking uh, on uh, w with w with our we have a, we have a discord group we talk we talk he was joking that he was actually um, I think taking a flight and he was on his iPhone and he as he was boarding the flight he was controlling that telescope and basically ordering it to go take some images and everything 
when he was just saying it's like it's an amazing time to be alive and be able to do this kind of thing and edwin hubble would probably be you know <laughs> you know completely shocked at the kind of stuff we can do um so we use any desk to link in we use this program nina which is a free or freeware program to effectively uh control and command the telescopes and then we use we can use sharp cap as well um, which is another program to try to do live viewing um i'm going to use sharp cap hopefully it'll, it'll work uh, to kind of do some of the live viewing a, a little bit later. Um, in the process of stacking, so um, most astrophotographers use PixInsight, which is this program over here on the right. It costs money, um, but there's also a number of free programs that you can use to stack um, to basically uh, improve your, um, your, 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 your calibrated images to effectively make them uh, able to be processed. And again, all of this kind of stuff, we will we we have courses that we that we teach that go into a lot of detail on how to do this and um, and with the gateway remote telescope we have a lot of data which you can basically use um, to make your own you know, your own your own astrophoto astrophotography pictures. Um, I've been I've been using the word stacking a lot, so I kind of found this um, this image on the web, which is a really good example of what stacking is. So effectively, what you're saying is if you take a single frame. Um, and that's kind of at the very beginning of this of, of this picture here. You take a single frame, um, a single frame of uh, of of an object. This is the dumbbell nebula. Um, is going to look kind of cr kind of cruddy. It's, you're going to have a lot of noise in the picture. You're going to have very uh, uh, very poor signal to noise ratio. But when you take um, hundreds and hundreds of these pictures and you kind of stack them, put them all on top of each other. So if you think about what the process is, we're effectively cleaning cleaning each of the frames to effectively make them calibrated. And then we're taking every single frame and we're, and we're effectively adding another frame on top. And as you do that, you effectively create um, a, a much cleaner image and you improve the signal to noise ratio, which is what this little graph here at the bottom is showing. Um, and you go from a, what looks to be a completely unreadable, very hard to, to kind of fathom what this thing is image on the left. And uh, you go to an image that looks Kind of like uh, uh, what you see, you know, on the internet, on the Hubble, uh, on the Hubble photos, and that's kind of the goal of what we're trying to do, um, to kind of to kind of tease out this kind of hidden detail that's in uh, that's in the data. Um, so here's an example of uh, um, this is NGC 869, which is the double cluster in Hercules. This was taken with the AP 175, and um, we have, as as I mentioned, we have two telescopes and we have two cameras. Um, the camera um, that, uh, that is on the small telescope is a color camera. So it takes images in full color. Um, the camera on the big telescope is what's called a mono camera. So it takes images in black and white. And we have a filter wheel that has a series of filters that we then take images through those filters. So in order to make a color, a color image, we have to take images with a red, a green, and a blue filter, uh, and maybe a luminance filter. And then we combine all of those into color. And we also have narrow band filters, um, which we'll talk about uh, probably later, or you know, again in, in one of our classes, where we can basically take um, and isolate very small parts of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum, usually uh, in nebula, uh, to in accentuate and bring out um, you know the features of the nebula, whether it's a, whether it's an emission nebula or whether uh, it's a reflection nebula. These kind of those kind of nebulas have different kinds of spectral classifications. So here's a, here's an example of the data. So we took, you know, we, we took our, 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 our frames. Um, here's an example of the frames we were taking, blue frames, green frames, and, uh, and luminous frames, red frames. And we basically uh, clean them all and we create master, master uh, um, stacks of each of those uh, series uh, of pictures. So here's a, um, a master of a luminance uh, and, and a man, uh, uh, a master uh, of a red and then a master uh, blue and a master green. And then we basically um, take them all and we combine them. And here's just some, some tools and pics in sight that we would use to, to do that. Um, and we get basically a color, a color picture. And then we get, uh, pics in sight's got some fancy tools. This is a tool where we can effectively uh, match all the colors in those stars to actually the colors that are, that are, that are scientifically proven uh, using um, a, a, a database, a Gaia database, to effectively ascertain the exact spectral type of color. So we get a we get a, we get effectively a, a curve fit that gives us the true color of all those stars. And then uh, finally, we create an image, and it kind of looks like that. 
So um, that's the process. Um, and again, um, you know, the goal for us um, with the GRT was to effectively give members um, the ability to sort of produce these type of photos with a with a, a fabulous instrument in a dark sky location, uh, and then effectively be able to download all that data. And um, you know, the different levels of tiers that we have. The lowest tier that's paid um, is an amazing deal. It's thirty bucks for the for for life, and you'll effectively get access to all of the images that these telescopes take. And um, I don't. Know if Stan's going to talk about how many images we have, how, how many um, different. Um, uh, uh, repositories of data we have already, but it's likely that a, that a year from now we'll probably have literal, literally over a hundred different targets and probably something you know close to thirty or forty gigabytes of data. So there's going to be a lot there. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now and kind of hand it back. Uh, Alfredo, I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so uh, on the big scope that's black and white, if you want to take an image of an object. Um, uh, you let's say you take a hundred images, a hundred red, a hundred green, a hundred blue. Uh, that th that means you're taking three hundred images. So that takes longer to do, as opposed to the smaller scope, which is a full color camera. You take one image and you have you know a color image, and you take three hundred and you could stack that and have and boost your resolution. Is that correct? That is correct. Absolutely right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Stan, did you want to um, talk about the data? So this is our data subscriber folders. The data subscriber is uh, at that, that tier level is $30, $30 per year, which is a, an amazing deal because for for, uh, for $30, you can get access to uh, this entire list of, these are all raw files raw, taken from the, uh, the Gateway Telescope through uh, both the AP-175 telescope uh, designated here, but also the, the AT-60 telescope. And so the, the 10 telescope operators that we have work on their own project, but they also, uh, they also image uh, a lot of the objects that are picked by the, uh, the target selectors who select the actual targets uh, that, that, that they want to see in various images. So we have this fairly big list here, uh, which is kind of amazing. And we've got about uh, six galaxies and about 25, 26 nebulas and about uh, five to six star clusters, uh, just from the uh, the Gateway Telescope, and we also have a access to files from a, a Cerebolo telescope, which is a pretty high end, uh, essentially a mirror telescope that that's also owned by uh, John Kasinowicz. He's the amateur astronomer that uh, is letting us use the the AP one seventy five rig for our Gateway Telescope, and he's got a second setup at the uh, Dark Sky Observatory in, uh, in West Texas that uh, collects a, lo a lot of files. So we have access to those and we're introducing those about three a month. So we, we've got a, uh, a couple of nebulas, a couple of clusters and uh, two galaxies in this folder as well. And so the, the data subscribers, the uh, telescope operators and the target selectors all have access to uh, this, this data. And so we have you could download each uh, individual uh, folder with the, with the different objects in them. And then we also have uh, calibration files, which are the, the dark flats and the BIOS files that uh, allow you to uh, just, just get cleaner looking uh, data, uh, reducing the, the noise level and some of the artifacts that, that show up uh, when you're out in a dusty area. Uh, so that's all. That's all available to uh, to the the, the three p uh, tier levels, the, the paid levels for the Gateway Telescope. I just jump in with a couple of questions here. Um, sure. First off, uh, Steve Balavia, who's on the committee, uh, the GRT committee, chimes in and says that the scope's at six thousand feet, which is really important because you can really get some extremely dark skies at that altitude, and that's that's important. And um, I also want to say, uh, just parenthetically, that this committee has been amazing to me. Uh, there are so many guys that are uh, involved with that that know what they're doing. And uh, when when we all uh, were working together to decide whether to go with this project, I mean, people like Steve and others were fine tooth combing the gear and the process and all this stuff. And uh, so we. 
it, we really felt that that we vetted this system really well, and uh, so we're we're very pleased with with uh, the kind of data we're getting off of the scope and its performance. And one other question um, for Alfredo was, uh, why not have a color scope on uh, a color camera on the big scope? Um, it's just that the 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 system that we sort of uh, inherited had um, had already a um, a mono camera. And by the way, the 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 big scope has a top of the line scientific camera. It's a PLI uh, sixteen eight zero three uh, CCD sensor. Um, so that thing nowadays it's a little bit out of date because most um, astrophotographers are going with CMOS sensors. But that's like a ten thousand dollar camera. So it's a very high end camera. Um, that's already on it. Um, and so we basically decided, you know, why why break a good thing? So we just basically kept that. And the camera that we bought for the smaller scope, um, you know, we uh, we figured you know, there's always the op there's always the option at some point that we could swap them if we wanted to. Another uh, another re reason is a, a lot of people who do the deep sky imaging, through uh, through these various rigs, even even if you were just to take take your telescope uh, in person you know, out to a site, a lot of people prefer using the mono camera. You have more a little bit more control over things like the uh, red, green, blue, the three colors that make up the color picture. But also you could you could uh, image with the narrowband filters uh, a little bit more successfully. The things like hydrogen, alpha, sulfur, and, and oxygen, uh, which we could also do with the with the color camera. Uh, the color camera just makes it a lot easier, I think, for novices, people like me, who, who really don't do much of the deep sky imaging, but I think would would uh, benefit from just having one one file to deal with. But uh, with the uh, the telescope operators that we have are many of them are extremely experienced and they they prefer the mo the mono camera. They feel like they have more control over the the actual image and how they could uh just place all the different different colors in the image and as you'll see in a few minutes uh we're, we're getting some pretty incredible pictures that uh, we're, we're putting up on the gateway gallery is it not also uh, achieving higher resolution in that you when you take an image you're just working with one color and the whole the whole sensor is getting all those all those pixels if you will whereas a color camera is divided up into red blue and green that's right so, so you're, you're, uh, it's almost, I guess, I mean, just, I could be wrong about this, but it would be a third of the resolution that you would have, uh, if that's the right word. Uh, yeah, it's, it's more the, the time to, 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 to gain the image. So your, your a color camera has what's called a Bayer matrix in front of it. So it has basically these little filters that are in front of each, each of the pixel wells. And so that's effectively obstructing some of that light. Um, so it basically means that a mono camera is just much, much more sensitive. That's the that's the benefit. It's a lot more sensitive. Okay. What's next? Alfredo, you want to go back to Nina and sh show a few more uh, a few more objects? Okay, great. So let me uh, let me go ahead and do that now. I have to say that this is the first time we're doing this and uh there's going to be some glitches i'm sure so just so just be uh patient with our with our glitches um and don't judge us too too harshly for that <laughs> um all right so let's go ahead so I, I i just happened to bring up andromeda so we're, we're going to be looking at andromeda and let me know if you can see that yeah. so this is this yeah. is a, a live view from the telescope right now uh, and we're looking at Andromeda. Um, so this is SharpCap that I'm using to effectively capture it. So this is not the main telescope control program. Um, and oops, sorry about that. Let me bring that up. Okay. So so basically in SharpCap we have the feature, the ability to take um, multiple images and stack them. And the color balance on this is off. That's why it looks like this crazy color here. Um, and I can try to sort of, you know, fix the color a little bit. Um, but I haven't had enough time to sort of to sort of figure to sort of play play with it to get the the right color combination. And I think if I do the auto color, it's not going to work. That nah, didn't work. Um, but anyways, so um, so if you look at this program, what it's doing is if if you look at it, I'm taking thirty second exposures with this camera, 
Um, and right now I've taken 11, I, I've done 11 exposures. Um, and this is kind of what we're seeing um, after 11 exposures. And I can sort of play with the, his, with the histogram here. Um, if I wanted to, I could kind of like, you know, move it around a little bit and kind of give us a little bit more of a different view. <laughs> I can sort of try to tell it to All right, so, and again, this is, um, yeah, this is, I'm trying to get the, the blue to come down here for a second. All right, we're getting a lot of red there. Hold on a second. Let, oh, wait, let me try to do this here. Let me see if you be see if that does it. Okay, let me start it over. Clear. We'll start it over here. We'll start to build the image again. All right, so here's the first frame. So you can see the countdown here. It's counting as the frame comes in. And again, these are 30 second frames. And we should try, try to see it build the image. Um, So there's the first one right there. And you can see it's kind of like this. You'll see what, what I mentioned earlier about, about how you clean it up. You can see, again, it's like blotchy and whatnot around the sides there. And as the second one loads, it should get a little cleaner. There's a lot of red here. Let me get rid of this red. Okay, we got two there now. That sister galaxy uh, is already showing up. Yeah, okay, you can see it on the side here, right? Oh, yeah. oh man, the green really killed it. Let me put down the green a little bit. And um, the one thing I would say about this, so um, the, the, the computers that are on these telescopes that are controlling the telescopes, um, are usually industrial kind of small computers that they're kind of built to basically weather sandstorms and really bad weather and super hot temperatures. So they tend to be kind of older PCs. So mm -hmm. it, the PCs don't have the processing power that a lot of the newer, a lot of newer PCs that we have. I think the PC on this rig is actually from 2014. So some of the processing that we're trying to make it do in, um, in SharpCap, it might just be kind of overloading it to some degree. And that's why you can see when I'm trying to sort of change the colors, it's going so slowly. Um, it's just because that the PC that's on that's on the telescope is not meant to do this. It's meant to effectively, um, you know, control the telescope. Not Steve, Steve is saying that uh, make sure you reset the other histogram and colors in the right pane. You can't have live stack competing with the other controls. All right, thank you, Steve. There's got to be somebody out there who knows how to use SharpCap more than I do. Appreciate that. All right, that kind of helps a little bit. Let me see if I go down, get rid of the blue here. All right, so while this is happening, let me go show you guys um, the other um, the other scope. So here, we're gonna go into the other scope. Before I do that, let me just um, go into this one here for a second. Uh, this is the old, the one I was using before. I'm just gonna disconnect the mount here. Back. We're, we're going to go to in about 10 minutes we'll go to the image of the month okay hold on so let me just um let me just go here for a second go to this telescope here and connect this mount okay so what i want to show you guys now is let me go back into sharp cap for a second all right so here we are um with the um the andromeda galaxy um with the small telescope right so i'm gonna i'm gonna now um go to the big telescope so i'm gonna pause this i'm gonna go to the big telescope and i'm going to tell it to let's say let's say we want to go look at um what was the other one that we wanted to do stan oh m33 right so let's say i wanted to go to m33 which is another galaxy the triangle the triangle galaxy 
I can basically pull it up here. And we'll load it here for a second. Should pop up right here. Okay. Didn't load. Hold on. Um, oh, there it is. Sorry about that. Okay. And yeah, we're going to load it. Let's download it to it. Yeah, it takes a while to load. Yeah, so. So what we're going to tell it now is we're going to tell the big telescope to slew or to move to the other galaxy uh, and we'll image that one. So here's M and you can see it. It's going to show us how we're going to frame it. So basically I can tell it to do that. And um, now the telescope will effectively, um, this little box here tells us that the telescope is moving and actually I can show you, um, let's go here, take a look. So here's the telescope. See if it moved. I guess it, re it moved already. I was too slow. Okay, so uh, here's the first. Um, it's taking a picture right now. It's sitting down here. It's taking a six second, six second picture. And it's going to effectively solve. Here's the, this is the galaxy right here. You, can, you can't really tell, it's, and it's told us that it's sort of figured out where it is, which is good. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to take a 60 cent, 60 second picture. Um, once it sort of it's centering the image exactly in the center here. Now this 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 is the other camera. This is the scientific camera. So this is not going to be in color. It's going to be in black and white. Um, so give me a second here. It's, it's basically now centered. It was pretty centered as it was, but um, it wants to be exactly perfect. Okay, there it is. So now, now I've now I've told it to take a um, a sixty second image. Um, and again, this is why you know when we're doing live uh, 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 observing, usually. Um, you know, we're we're effectively stacking in the background, and then we're we're, we're showing the images after uh, some time because you know people don't usually want to wait around uh, for sixty seconds. But you can see it here counting down. Um, we'll, we'll let this one go, and then um, we can start to talk about the other stuff. And then in the background, I can sort of put some more of these images in so that we can have them teed up um, to go. But here's the thirty seconds to go on this one. Um, and you know the um, we've already focused that so the, the the telescope's already in focus and everything. Uh oh, sorry about that. <laughs> there it is. Wow. Right here. Mm. There, there it is. So again, um, a single frame is not going to show us the kind of detail that we normally would see in uh, high resolution astrophotography. Um, but you know it's going to it's going to it's going to look pretty good. Now with this particular scope and camera, we could also do a very long exposure. Like I could do, let's say, let's say I wanted to do a longer exposure. Let's say I wanted to do a three hundred second exposure. That, that's five minutes, right? So like, you know, five minutes. No one's going to want to wait around for five minutes. So I'll let this run for five minutes, and in the interim, maybe we'll uh, we'll go to the gallery. What do you guys think? Yeah, it sounds like a sounds like a plan. All right, cool. Let me do, let me do that, and then you stop sharing. Excellent. So I'm going to queue up the, so in case I didn't make this clear earlier, or if you didn't hear it earlier on, um, we, we're doing an image of the month. We got a lot of people now submitting images. So it's really kind of exciting. We're at the, we were talking earlier, we're gonna have to figure out how to get a dead, deadline cutoff date so we don't have so many images coming in, but um, Let's see, right now we have 11 images up for the January image of the month. And uh, I think- Excuse me, Pre Preston, and uh, just to let everybody know, these are all up and you can see these on the Gateway Gallery. If you just right. go to AAA.org and go on the Gateway page, a little ways down on the page is a, is a button for the gate, sends you right to this Gateway Gallery. And 
you could see all these pictures and uh, click click on each picture and and you could do a slideshow and they're they they show up pretty big on your screen. So uh, we're going to go down these eleven images uh, relatively quickly here, and uh, the first three because it's in alphabetical order is by Alfredo Villegas, our esteemed president. So you want to tell us what we're looking at? Okay. Um... So we're looking at the M78 Cerevelo, yes. Cerevelo yes. image. So, um, so this is this is Messier 78, um, which is a reflection nebula in um, in 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 the constellation Orion. It's about 1,600 uh, light years uh, from Earth. Um, a reflection nebula basically is just a, is just a nebula um, that there is usually a bright star associated with it, and and it's basically like the name implies, it's basically reflecting the light of that, um, and you can basically see the hot stars that are that are embedded uh, in that nebula that are basically lighting it up to make that sort of blue, uh, that blue glow that you see there. Okay, next one. All right, this is, um, this was also taken, um, this the, the first one was taken with the Cerevolo scope. This one was taken with the AP-175 scope. And it's basically a, 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 a single image, well, a single, a, a, a framed um, a shot of both um, M81, uh, which is Bode's galaxy, that's the galaxy at the bottom there, uh, which is a beautiful spiral galaxy, and M82, which is a, so a galaxy that's on, its, that, that's on its side, a side profile. Sometimes M82 is called the Cigar Galaxy. Both of these galaxies are in are, are, are some major, um, and um, they're about 12 million light years away. Um, and what's really neat about M80, uh, M82 at, at the top there, if you can tell in the center, um, there's some like stuff coming out of the center. That's because um, that that galaxy um, has extreme star forming going on uh, in, in 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 its core, likely because it was part of a merged galaxy. And so there's basically fireworks going on there, and that's kind of what we're seeing. And we can we pull that out in this image by actually taking um, hydrogen alpha data along with the RGB data to sort of highlight that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I also want to mention the. Uh, that when you talk about pulling hydrogen alpha data, um, there's filters that do that. We can that's, see we can see in these frequency spectrums of oxygen and hydrogen alpha that you can't necessarily see with a human eye. And so that's one of the that's one of the interesting things about using astrophotography is that you can you know sure you can see basically your red green blue with your eye, but when you add these other elements to it, these other frequencies that the human eye doesn't detect, we have to figure out what color to make it, right? And that, so you right. were mentioning a palette earlier. I think uh, there's a Hubble palette, which is very famous. Yeah, uh, we'll see that. We'll see that in the, in the next image. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. So um, this is called the uh, the, the Tadpole Nebula. Um, also, uh, IC410 is its uh, is its um, designation. It's it, it's also an emission nebula, meaning that it is being lit up by the really bright stars um, that that are basically behind the gas that's in the nebula. Um, it's about 12,000 light years away um, in the constellation Auriga, the chariot. And um, basically, uh, this one, um, it, like Preston was saying, we basically took in narrowband, which basically means we took it in the, the primary three narrowband channels that astrophotographers shoot in, hydrogen alpha, um, uh, uh, molecular oxygen or oxygen three, uh, and, uh, and, and, and sulfur. And basically then those three very specific uh, um, uh, spectral uh, ranges, um, and we use three nanometer fi filters, so these are three nanometer uh, ranges. Uh, we basically then combine them in what's called the Hubble palette, and all that basically means is that we map those those um, filters to specific colors. So the Hubble palette is usually um, de designated as 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 SHO. So basically, S or sulfur, uh, we map to red. Uh, H or hydrogen alpha, we map to green, and O, uh, we map to blue. And so when you look at this um, at, at this picture, the blue uh, is basically that that ionized oxygen, um, and the red is the sulfur um, that's in this that's in this nebula. Okay, next one. This is uh, Andrew Warner, ghost of Cassiopeia. Right. So um, this is. Um, uh, basically lo located in the constellation Cassiopeia. It's about 600 light years uh, um, from Earth. Um, and that super duper bright star there, that's called Gamma Cassiopeia. And that 
star uh, is ionizing or, or lighting up um, portions of that of, of that nebula. Um, and because of the intense radiation um, from the star, um, basically you can see, uh, again, that ionization like you saw in the prior one. But here it's much more uh, distinctively um, the source of that ionization is much easier to see because the star is so close, so close to it. Um, and it's not just uh, the, the molecular oxygen, it's also ionizing a lot of hydrogen gas, and that's why it's red. So it's, 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 it's ionizing a lot of that as well. And this, I believe, is a double star. And I believe if you look at Cassiopeia, it's right in the center. It's right in the middle of the W. It's that middle star, I believe. Mm, correct. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. This, this was a red this, this is Ed Rojas. Uh, yeah, this is the wizard, the wizard nebula. Um, a, a lot of the names that that astrophotographers give to nebulas just be, it's just basically what it reminds people of, or what they, people think they see in it. It's kind of like you look at a cloud and you say that looks like you know Winnie the Pooh or something like that. I don't know. There's no Winnie the Pooh nebula that I know, but you know someone could always find something and want to name it that. Um, mm -hmm. The um, it, the, the the wizard nebula is also an, an emission nebula. It's located in the constellation Cepheus. Um, and th this nebula has been been known for a long time. It was actually discovered by um, by uh, William Herschel's sister Caroline uh, mm -hmm. in 1787. Uh, it's about 7,200 light years away. Um, and um, again, you can see the uh, the atomic uh, hydrogen that's being ionized. Um, and this uh, nebula is also an act, a, a region of active star formation. Um, so uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work that's been done in astrophysics basically studying this nebula. And just a, a side note that Ed is, uh, Ed Rojas, this is his image. Um, Ed was uh, here at, at, he's been a member of AAA for some time, and now he's living in London, been there for a, a few years now. And I think it's just so cool that uh, one of our members living in London can still access this data and, and basically come up with images like this. It's one of the uh, cool things about this project. Okay, next. This is the Flaming Star, again by Ed. Yeah, so uh, also known as IC405. Uh, it is both an, em an emission and a reflection nebula. Um, so uh, as, the, as the word implies, a reflection nebula basically um, is, is able to take that star, the, uh, the ionization energy or that the energy from the star radiation and reflect it. So you've got both an emission uh, and a reflection that's going on in, in, in this nebula. Uh, it's also in the constellation Auriga, and it's about 1,500 light years uh, from, from Earth. Um, and um, you don't have a nearby star that, 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 that's obviously associated with this, like you have with Gamma Cassiopeia, but you do have a star that's well known that is, uh, that is effectively um, energizing this, this nebula, and that's um, uh, AE Auriga, which is a, a bright star. Uh, but it just happens to be outside the frame here, so you, you can't you can't quite see it. Um, and basically, some people imagine that there could have been um, there could have been some uh, stellar some some stellar collision uh, that occurred, perhaps a co collision of two binary stars that could have created some some aspect of this uh, of this nebula. Okay, moving along here. This is the Spaghetti Nebula by uh, Mike Eckenbergs. So. Um, Every image that you've seen here before is is so far is has been by the by the larger telescopes either by the AP one seventy five or by um, the Cerevolo. This image is by the small telescope, that one that we shot with the color camera, that first image that you saw that I couldn't get the colors to balance. Um, and so um, this is called the Spaghetti Nebula. Um, it's a supernova remnant. So this is basically a star that's blown its guts out, and this is sort of the the the, the remnants of that. Um, of that expanding shell as the star um, has, um, ha ha has, has disintegrated. Um, based on the radio velocity and the, and the expansion of, of, of this nebula, um, uh, scientists have dated the actual explosion of, of that star to about 40,000 uh, years ago. Um, and again, like what you see here are the expanding shock waves uh, from uh, the death of that star. We got to move along. We got a few more, just a few minutes left here. So this is okay. the... Um, NGC 7822 by Steve, Steve Balavia, who has been helping us along here tonight. Yep. This is the constellation Cepheus. It's about 3,000 light years away. Um, and you can see this one's got some really nice structures, both dark and, and light, uh, in, in terms of um, the, the composition of the gas. 
Um, there's actually a large star cluster that is associated with this. So if you if, if we had taken it with a smaller telescope, you would actually see a really bright star cluster near it as well. Okay, this is the bubble nebula by Cancuccia. Yeah, this is an emission nebula. Uh, it's in Cassiopeia, um, and it's also um, it's it's basically it's, it. I don't know if you if you look at it, if you zoom in on it, it it it's almost a perfect spherical shape. Uh, and that's because there's a central star there that is basically um, emitting a huge amount of energy because it's a massive O-type star. Uh, and it's basically the stellar wind from that star is basically radiating out in kind of a very, it's a sphere, so it's radiating out in a very spherical shell. And it's basically pushing that gas away. So if, if it's kind of like this was, this, was the, this was the birth of a star. And as that star basically was born, it basically cast aside sort of its, swat, its swaddling blankets of, of gas. And that's what you're seeing there. All right, we got to move quickly. We got two more left. This is Tom Cucci's dolphin head, which I think is beautiful nebula. This is, this is in Canis Major. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's also, um, you can see basically the, the ionization energy in that one, just like we saw in the other one. It's about 4,500 light years away. Um, and finally, we have the snowman nebula by also by Tom. Yeah, this this one's in the constellation Monocerosis. Um, it's uh, it's like the dolphin. It's also it, it, it's 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 also an emission nebula. Um, I couldn't really find too much more about it. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna. This is up to you. This is audience. <clears throat> excuse me, audience participation. Uh, we're gonna do a. Uh, Give you 60 seconds to decide on uh, which image uh, that you like uh, you're going to pick as number one and uh, as soon as i get my screen squared away here not right there so you have 60 seconds now to decide and we're going to run through them all 11 images right now Okay, send in your, your vote on our chat. Also, if you want to go to our gallery, you can use this QR code to check it out. Um, and uh, we have to wrap it up here. I just want to say uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, we, uh, we're we very excited about this project and I hope you are too. And you, know, you can help support the project financially by going to our Gateway Gallery page. And right in the middle of the page, there's a but you can press to make a donation. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, this is a pilot project, like we said before, and we're exploring and we, we, uh, we're very excited about the growth of this thing. It's, it's really amazing. And also this video will be shown on YouTube. I will be putting it up in a few days so you can uh, see the whole thing over again, if you like. Tell your friends, uh, call the neighbors, wake the kids, you know, let them know what's going on. And let's see what else. I think uh, I think that's it. You guys uh, want to say anything else, uh, Stan or or Alfredo? Yeah, maybe give them uh, everybody another minute to vote. Uh, also, our uh, astrophotography Google group meetup will meet on this Monday night at 8 p.m. and we'll talk about photographing the total eclipse on April 8th. Uh, and so if you've ever had any uh, questions about how to photograph an eclipse, uh, tune in at 8 p.m. on Monday, the 29th. I'll be sending out a, a, an announcement in a Zoom link on the astrophotography Google group e email and the uh, the universe uh, AANY uh, at groups.io uh, email. So, so uh, everybody outside the group will also get the, get the Zoom link. Great. We got folks coming in uh, that... that uh... <clears throat> Solar eclipse is in April on April eighth, and uh, so figure out where you're going to be and uh, take Stan's uh, uh, Monday class so you don't burn up your camera. <laughs> okay, we're, we're we're waiting for votes to still come in, but uh, thank you everybody. We appreciate your uh, watching tonight, and uh, if you have any other questions, uh, toss them. Uh, I'll tell you what, you can go to 
any of our three names, uh, uh, stan.honda at AAA.org, uh, Alfredo Villegas, dot Villegas at uh, AAA.org, or Preston Staley at AAA.org if you have any questions. We're happy to, to uh, answer your questions best we can. Okay. Yeah, I'll just Go ahead. Quick, I'll just quickly, if anyone would like to hang around, I mean, I'm happy to, um, we've got uh, about 10 minute exposure on M33 that's coming up if anybody wants to take a look and, um, you know, happy to happy to stick around for a couple of minutes. If anybody wants any specific target, we could try to, you know, slew to it just to give you kind of a, a quick look at it if it's something you'd like you'd like to do. Yeah, thanks everybody for attending and uh, yeah, feel, feel free to, to stick around. I'm gonna stop the recording right now. Okay, cool.